Okay, tonight's a big night. We do Rick, come. Okay, Buddha, Buddha nature, Buddha essence. And uh, we got a lot to cover tonight, so I'm going to kind of go fast, and we might go a little bit late, sorry. Um, well, okay. But tonight, we, we actually do the Rang Luk, our own system on what is Buddha nature. So again, to remind you, this month, class number six was ideas from the Uttara Tantra about Buddha nature and how it's concealed and why it's concealed and angles from which it's concealed and angles from which it's revealed. And then this class, the second of the three, is about Rik, meaning what is the classical presentation, our classical presentation of Buddha nature, you know? So that'll be covered in four parts. Uh, what is the proof from scripture about the idea of Buddha nature? Like, where do you get this idea of Buddha nature from scripture? Um, second part was, what was that? Uh, definitions of Buddha nature. You know, like classical presentation of Buddha nature. I missed something in there. Mm, well, we'll figure it out. Uh, then the third part would be, uh, what was that? Uh, let me look. The fourth one I can tell you. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, uh, fourth one is going to be, there's a very interesting um, tantric presentation of uh, Buddha nature. So I thought to throw that in. Uh, and then, uh, what was the third one? Let me see. Hang on. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay, what did I say was the first one? Okay. Yeah, that's not the first one. First one is uh, different names for Buddha nature. Okay, like in the scriptures, you see a whole bunch of different names for Buddha nature. So I thought I'd go over them. So first we get different names for Buddha nature. Then we get classical scriptural references, both by the Buddha and by later people. And then thirdly, we get the classical presentation. What are the different types of Buddha nature, stuff like that. And then fourth one will be... Um, Sort of a special tantric take on Buddha nature, okay? How Buddha nature is developed. Okay, well, anyway, uh, names for Buddha nature, generally, they're going to have two parts, each one of them. And the first part is pretty interchangeable. It's like three different words for Buddha, right? But really, what we're really interested in is all the different names for nature. But you might get Buddha nature, those who have gone thus nature, those who have gone to bliss nature. And so the first three names are pretty much interchangeable. So I'm just going to write them. Um, well, we'll start with the first one. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm going to put also the Sanskrit pronunciation, and then you'll get the Sanskrit writing from Christy La, who's going to do the Sanskrit for this class and the last class a week from tonight, 6 o'clock p.m., okay? So you come in early next Wednesday, which will be the, the next and last class of this month on Uttara Tantra. You come an hour early if you want the Sanskrit, and you'll get two classes of Sanskrit, okay? So I'll just put the pronunciation. And this is just if you're, you know, if you're teaching Rick in Tucson in October, come, right? You should know the different words, and then you should know the Sanskrit. They come up a lot. You see them. A lot of people, because it's so hard to come up with an English word for Buddha nature, or Buddha essence, or Buddha seed, or whatever, people sometimes just say Tathagatagarbha. 
Um, the accent is actually long here, so it's Tathagata Garba. Say Tathagata Garba. Tathagata Garba. Tathagata Garba. Th is an unfortunate transliteration of um, Sanskrit ta as opposed to ta. See? This is ta. This is ta. It's not ta. Okay? It's not Tathagata or Tathagata or, some, or Geshe Tharchan. Okay? Uh, it's Tathagata Garbha. Okay, say one more time. Tathagata Garbha. Okay, good. Um, Deshin, which is Tata, means like that. Just that way. Just that way. Uh, gata, which is Shekbe, means gone. Gone that way. Okay? Then uh, Ningbo, which means, I'm going to translate it tonight as essence means garba, is for garba, okay? Um, this is the Ningbo that you see in the Heart Sutra, Shirab Ningbo, for example, and it can be translated as heart or essence, okay? And um, we're going to talk more about that in a minute. But garba, I thought you'd like to know the, the literal sense of it, because then if you know the Sanskrit, you get a better sense of it. Garb, what, what would you guess the English cognate is? Garden? Um, keep the B sound. Garbage. Maybe, but I don't know. Uh, put the G in the R. Put the R after the G. R. Grab. Okay, grah, grab, grub in Sanskrit means to grab. And what it means, it came from an ancient word for womb. And the idea is that the seed is, what do you call it, catches in the womb, and then the baby starts to grow. Like we say in English, I think, catch, the seed catches in the womb, and then there's, um, what do you call it? Uh, An embryonic journey. Yeah, when the, when, <laughs> what do we call it? Uh, at the very beginning. Conception. conception, yeah, the moment of conception. Well, conceptio, right, uh, is, uh, is to grab. It means you catch, and then you start to grow, <laughs> okay? See, so the idea is that garba means womb, you see? It means the hold, the hold. Even in um, the Heart Sutra, where is the Heart Sutra taught? taught? Rajagur. Yeah, Rajagur. Gur has the same root, which means the keep of the king or the hold of the king. Rajagurha means the king's, uh, the place where the king holds power. Raja Gurha. Um, and reg comes from raja and r regal and royal and all those words. So anyway, garba means the womb, uh, the, the Buddha womb. Okay, get the feeling of it? And then the Tibetans chose to translate that as Ningmo, meaning essence or heart. Okay? So you start to get a feeling of what all the meanings that are floating around here. It's nice to see the Sanskrit and the Tibetan. Okay, here's number two. You're going to be asked on the homework to give three of them out of five. So you can turn off after the third one. I thought there were two parts to the four different names for Buddha nature, so after eight. Oh, it's going to be something like that. You can, you can mix them, mix and match, All okay? Right. Yeah. Uh, oh, I didn't put the Tibetan there. Oops. Okay. The master has a boo-boo. Uh, That's why it's hot. <laughs> Come here. That's the Khmer bird. Come here. Come here. Say Dewar. Shekpe, Ningbo. The last one was what in Tibetan? 
Te Shin Shek Be Ningbo. And now we got De Wor Shek Be Ningbo. Almost the same, right? A little bit different. In, to, in Sanskrit, Sugata Garba. Say Sugata? Sugata. Garba. Garba. Okay. Mm, Garba, again, is the same sense of the womb. Uh, Sugata means gone well or gone to happiness. And it can mean either uh, went somewhere in an easy way or, or a, f a flow, nice flow. Like peop This refer is the name for the Buddhas, right? Deshen Shepa and Tathagata are just names for Buddhas. Those who have gone that way. Those who have gone to happiness. Those who have gone to bliss. Those who have gone well. So su means well, gata means gone. Ga came into English to gum, became come. Uh, and then su came into, in the Indo-European is esu, E-S-U. The S dropped out of Greek and it became the U in euthanasia, euphonic, eurythmics. All right, yeah, okay. So this, this is found in Greek as E-U because it came from an old Indian ESU. So it means good, good gone, womb. And the Tibetans translated that as uh, the essence of those who have gone happily or well. Uh, I'm going to call this, yeah, I'm going to keep calling it essence, okay? Shekha is again gone. Gone, like gata. Gata is gati gati para gati para sangati bodhisattva. You know, gone, gone, really gone. That's the Heart Sutra mantra, right? Okay, that was the second one, right? Here's the third one. What is the third one? Uh, ew, that's a mess. Oh, see, okay. Here's the third one. Say Daishin? Shepe? Ningbo. Sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now you get something really interesting. This is my advertisement. I spent uh, last week at Art House, and we really had a good time, but um, in Howell. And uh, he's like adamant that people should get some Sanskrit under their belt, you know, as if it's not enough to spend 20 years on your Tibetan. But um, this is a case where the Tibetans use the same translation for a different Sanskrit word. You see, the Tibetans uh, only had one word for heart and essence, uh, whereas the Sanskrit was two different words. So here you get a nice feeling for how cool it will be, like in the Tantric course when we get to the, we're going to do a lot of the Tantric course in Sanskrit, from Sanskrit originals. Um, and then you'll get more of a gut feeling for it, because our language comes from Sanskrit. Okay? So Tathagata is the same, gone that way, meaning Buddhas. And then herdaya. Uh, guess what word comes from this part of it? Heart. heart. Directly comes from herdaya. Okay, heart. The heart of the Buddhas. Okay. Uh, so now you got a new word for Buddha nature. Heart. Buddha heart. Buddha heart. Okay. Literally, the to, the the Shedab Ningbo is called Prajnaparamita herdaya. The heart of the essence of the, the heart of the perfection of wisdom is the real name of the Heart Sutra. Okay, and that's straight from Herdaya. Okay, <clears throat> but the rest is all the same in Tibetan, right? So here you have a case where, uh, which is actually not that common, where if you know the Tibetan, the Sanskrit could have been two different things, and you might hear two different words, and then you really get a different feel, don't you? I mean, a womb and a heart is a different 
sing in a way. But, um, but in a way, they're the same, aren't they? So, kind of cool. Is that, is that bliss? Uh, no, this is the one that means they have gone that way. They tata. Tata means gone that way. Tibetan? Oh, Tatian, sorry, yeah. It means like that. Like that. Okay. Let me see what's the next one. Who's that girl? Who's that lazy girl? Okay, number four. Say, Rick. Rick. You gotta roll the R. Ruffles have ridges. I can't do it, really. Rick. Rick. Yeah, it's not done with your front teeth on your lower lip. It's done by flopping your tongue inside. Rick. Rick. Yeah, good. Uh, and then in Sanskrit, gotra. gotra. Yeah. Um, Rick means in Tibetan, like family or type. Uh, comes from what? Yeah, where does it come from? Bodhisattva Charavatara is found in the Tunduk, site six times a day, right? And, uh, <laughs> okay, and it's, the, and it's the basis for when you take Bodhisattva vows. You say, Today I've been born into the rick of the Buddhas, meaning the family of the Buddhas. Thus I have become a child of the Buddhas. Uh, now, no matter what, from today, I will try to act in accordance with my family. I won't try to, I'll try not to embarrass my family, basically. Okay. Um, Gotra, now let's see how they got that from Gotra, right? Gotra means a um, cattle pen. Go means cow. Okay, gwa came into English as cow. Also as, uh, what's another word for bovine is connected to this. And then tra means to protect, and it's found in the root for tara. Tara meaning the one who carries you be out of trouble. Droma, okay, so it's the same root. So gotra means a uh, cow protection, which means a, uh, a, pen. a pen or a fence. Together. Yeah. And then it, over the centuries, it became a word for um, family, you see? Because it was everyone in the same pen, you see? Yeah, same herd or something like that. The word Gautama, Buddha, Gautama means highest go, highest cow. And that's an idea of the head, head bull of the herd, which, you ever, which if you ever met one at Diamond Mountain West, you'd understand. You know, like the other cows are about this tall, maybe this tall? on the back, but the bull out there was like this, like I think five feet tall, and the, his back was five feet tall, and like if you ran into him one night, it was really scary. <laughs> but Gautama means that, head bull. Um, so Gotra means, it came to mean family, you see? And when the Tibetan translators in 1000 AD had to struggle with a word, they said, Rik, family, okay? Like Buddha family, okay? Um, I like to call it maybe I'm going to call it family seed, okay? I'll tell you why. We're going to come up with a lot of problems with translating Rick tonight. Rick is a big subject tonight. Rick and Kam are synonyms, okay? I mean, in most Buddhist scriptures, you'll see Kam. I think uh, Maitreya needed to cut uh, syllables, but uh, you'll see more common is Rick than Kam, okay? Um, okay, next one.
I'm going to go back one page because I want to add something. Okay, ready? Remember Geshe Tutu Rinchen? Go back one page. Leave three blank pages. Six days from now, we'll get back to that. <laughs> uh, up here, I want to add Sangye. Key. Say Sangeki, Rick, Sangeki, Rick. Um, now we get a third uh, word to put in front of the front part of Buddha nature, right? We had, you know, essence of those gone thus, essence of those gone to bliss, and now we have essence of Buddha, okay? Or uh, family seed of Buddha or something like that, okay? What I'm saying is that you can replace any of the first three. You could say Buddha. You could say those gone to bliss. You could say those gone that way. It doesn't matter. You can mix them up. It doesn't matter. But that's the third one, OK? I'm going to stop putting the first half now, OK? So we're up to calm. Say calm. Calm. Dhatu. 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 OK. Mm, not much to say. I would call it Buddha. I'm just kind of artificially trying to distinguish them from each other. Buddha part, maybe. Buddha part. Da means to set down something. We find it in the word deed, like a written document that's been set down and agreed to by everybody. We find it in the word fact. When you get from Sanskrit to Greek, the DH changes to F. So, so you find words that mean like set down, fixed, finished, okay? And it's like the part in you, which is a Buddha. Here you should get this kind of vision of uh, marble under the earth or something, you know, like something really substantial under your flesh. That's the idea, like the steel core of your being, the diamond core of your being is like datu, come. And from that, the Buddha will grow. You know, that'll trigger the Buddha, the growth of the Buddha, of your Buddhahood, okay? And there's one more, what was that? I'm gonna, hang on. This is just another Sanskrit word for rig. Say Rick. Rick. Vansha. 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 Okay, Vansha means uh, it's an old word for bamboo and for a certain kind of plant. And so it means a, 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 a plant family. Uh, Mercedes suggested me the word uh, genus, G E N U S, like, or what would be a word, David? I don't know. <laughs> a, a group of, a botanical group. Families. Yeah, family or species. Or, yeah, I mean, depending on how you know. Yeah. Species would be the last. Okay, it's almost like a species, or no, no, it wouldn't be species, right? It'd be a family. a family. Like a plant family or an animal family or a type or a genus of, okay? But there you get the feeling. Vansha came from a word for a group of plants that were grouped together into a family. So again, it's this idea of a, a genus or genealogy or a, a group, okay? So a family, but also the seed from which this family springs, and the womb, and the essence, and the heart. And those are all the words for Buddha nature, and you have to explore them, like go home and think about it, you know? All those feelings of a diamond core, a womb, a heart, essence, family seed, family. Uh, I like gene, actually, for Rick. You know, because it gives both feelings of a genus and a seed, you know, uh, a family 
and the seed from which the family grows. You see what I mean? So all of those are Buddha nature, okay? All of those, you start to get a feeling for what Buddha nature means in the native languages, okay? You also get, a, you get an interesting insight into the limitations that the Tibetans were faced with sometimes. Like sometimes they clarified one Sanskrit word by splitting into three different Tibetan words. Sometimes they were faced with two different Sanskrit words and didn't have different words and used one word. And then we lost something when that happened, you see, when it came down to us in, in a foreign language, okay? So it's good to have both available, especially when you get into Tantra, especially when you get into the inner body. It's very useful to have this Sanskrit because there are so, it's like 17 kinds of words for snow in Eskimo. You know, like slush snow, uh, second level slushy snow, third level slush snow, snow mixed with water. And when you get to Tantra, it's like 10 different distinctions of your central channel that are made in Sanskrit, but not necessarily in Tibetan. So as you'll find this weekend, we'll be getting into a lot of the older sources for, for our Tantric studies. Mm. Okay, now I want to go into sources for Buddha nature, you know. This is all setting up for next week, right, which is what? What's the third part of this class on Buddha nature going to be? We're going to have arguments from other schools. And I thought, um, I found, I also pulled out arguments from ancient India. You're going to get the Vaibhashika or the Abhidharma version of, of Buddha nature. Then you're going to get the Sutrist or the Logic School version of Buddha nature. Then you're going to get the mind-only version of Buddha nature, which are all different from the one you're studying tonight, which is the ultimate version, right? Uh, then we're going to throw in um, early Tibetan uh, wise sages, their version of Buddha nature and emptiness that carried, in a strong, carried on in a strong tradition up to the present time in some of the Tibetan traditions. So three ancient schools on Buddha nature and one uh, very strong uh, Tibetan school that was competing with Jetsun Kappa's presentation of emptiness, okay? Um, and I thought it'd be good for you to get it from the horse's mouth. So you'll be reading the original texts by those schools, okay? Uh, you'll get their own texts. They get to speak for themselves, which is not always the case in a, in a debate in the monastery, okay? Uh, and so if you're on our side, which we get to be tonight, right? It's called Rang Luke. We're wearing Galukpa hat tonight, yellow hat tonight. Um, you want to be able to pull out original scriptural proofs for Buddha nature, right? Being emptiness. And then uh, later we'll get into the, the logical proofs, but we start with scriptural proofs. Lord Buddha said this. Arya Sangha Maitreya said this. Um, Hari Bhadra, who wrote the greatest commentary on um, Maitreya's works um, about 600 years after a Sangha, you're going to get his version. These three are all accepted by all Tibetan schools. Okay, so if you get in a debate, you can either pull the logic hat out or you can pull out the scriptural proof hat. Uh, but if somebody says, oh, Buddha nature is not something negative, you're going to have three uh, kinds of ammunition to pull out. Lord Buddha, 500 BC. Um, Maitreya, 350 AD. Uh, Master Hari Bhadra, uh, 800s sometime in the 800s, okay? Before, and then after that, Buddhism comes to Tibet, and then we can't argue anymore because that's our own, you know, that would be like starting to get into Jetsu Kappa's uh, version. So, like when we debate inter-monastery debate, like Jebung versus Sarah, uh, we can't use Sarah textbooks, you see? We can only use earlier texts by Jetsu Kappa or earlier, you see? So it depends on what group you're in. You gotta be able to go back to a sources which are accepted by both parties. So that's what we're going through next. We're going to go through three sources accepted by all Tibetan parties. Okay? So if you ever get in a hot argument with somebody from another tradition about is Buddha nature emptiness? Or is Buddha nature a, an already existing Buddha inside of you? Or is Buddha nature um, something physical thing, it's like some kind of blue light inside of stuff like that. You can, get, you can say, no, look, 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 we had that back in uh, Uttara Tantra course. Here's the reading. Here's three quotations from Lord Buddha, Arya Sangha. Okay, we're going to go through those. I want you to memorize them if you're doing Tibetan track. They're not very long. They're just like little tiny sentences. Uh, they're very short. So here's the first one. <laughs> 
This is from the 20,000 verses, which is equals the middle length sutra on the perfection of wisdom. Any? Say Rabjo. Rabjo. Namkala. Namkala. Jai Jai. Jai Jai. Meching. Meching. Mimikso. Mimikso. This is the famous place where Lord Buddha begins to talk about Buddha nature. Okay, in the perfection of wisdom. What's the shorter length sutra? How long is that? 8,000. 8,000 verses. What's the longer length version? 100,000. 100,000. They say that those were all the short one in the old days and they lost the others. 100,000 verse presentation of perfection of wisdom is the, what well, used to be the short one. Then it got lost. So now that all we have, no, okay, it's enough. Uh, tell me who's the Rabjor? Sabudi, okay? We're from the diamond cutter, okay? He's like the fall guy for Lord Buddha, right? Who is he in disguise? Manjushri. Manjushri in disguise, right? So. So Lord Buddha is addressing, probably Subhuti has asked a question, and, and Lord Buddha is saying, Rabjor, which means Subhuti, okay. Namka? Sky. 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 La. J, I don't think you know. J means a footprint or a track or a trail left by a jet plane or, what do you call those things? Contrail. Contrail. It means like that. Or a deer track is called a J, or a footprint is called a J, or those places where you see the Lord Buddha has, has put his hand like the Chinese restaurant in Hollywood. Uh, you know, those are all called J, J, okay? Sometimes they call Lakja Joke J means handprint, okay? Uh, J, I'm sorry, oh, Chai, oh, this Jai, I'm sorry, this Jai means birds, bird apostrophe S, bird's track, bird's trail, trail of a bird who's flying through the sky, right? The contrail left by a bird flying through the sky, okay? Me. Doesn't exist. You can't see anything. It doesn't exist. Ching and mimikso, invisible. Can't see it. Can't see it. It doesn't exist and you can't see it. So the second jai here doesn't mean more? The first jai means of a bird, and the second j means uh, track. Okay? Those of you who know Tibetan, it's the word after, right? Mm -hmm like Jetumba or something like that. Um, Jesu. Jesu Yurang for Anu. But anyway, um, now i got to tell you where, what Lord Buddha is referring to. Lord Buddha is referring to the path of preparation. 
Okay, Lord Buddha is referring to the path of preparation. More specifically, uh, Lord Buddha is referring to the first of the four steps in the path of preparation, first of the four levels, which is called Say Tr Semo Sopa. What's the last one? Chichot. Say again. Tr Semo Sopa Chichot. You remember say taught it to us so many times, it's just like a mantra in my brain. You know, I don't even have to think about it. Tr means inner heat, heat. It means you're getting hot. It means for what? Seeing yeah, seeing emptiness directly. Getting hot, warming up. Okay. So Lord Buddha is talking about the first of those levels. He goes on through 12 more levels, okay? But I'll just tell you the first six, because that's easy. So okay. This one here is the heat level? Yeah, he's talking about heat level from the path of preparation. He could just as well have been talking about peak, which is the second level, mastery, which is the third level, highest thing in the universe, which is the fourth level, then what comes after that? Path of seeing, number five. And then path of habituation, number six. Let's stick with those six. He goes through seven more, but I don't want to do it tonight, okay? I'll say it again. Six deep realizations you can have in your spiritual career. This thing about the bird not leaving any track, contrail, in the sky when they pass by, is talking about the first of those six, which is heat. What's happening at heat? Uh, what's happening at the path of preparation? You're studying emptiness. Intellectual Understand. understandings of emptiness. Not direct, but you're thinking about emptiness. You know, you're starting to get it, you know, like from these classes. You're, you get pretty good jawline preparation from these classes, you know. Okay, I got it. I understand what emptiness is not, and I understand what emptiness is, okay? Especially with objects and subjects. You know, during the path of preparation, you're starting to get hot. You're getting close, okay? Hot, like that. Let's talk about the emptiness. That do you perceive emptiness? Yeah. Not intellectually. Intellectually, you gotta say yeah. You do intellectually. You know, somebody says, "Do you perceive emptiness in preparation?" You go, "Yeah," and then you let them squirm. <laughs> you know, let them prove to you why not. You know, yeah, you perceive it, but logically, logically, through thinking, through contemplation. Okay. Mm. Any special kind of emptiness? We never got into that. We never got into that. There's two schools of thought. I mean, there's a big debate about it. But one is, oh, just kind of emptiness in general. OK? Like when I stand up here and talk about emptiness, you are perceiving emptiness. You're having an inkling of emptiness. That's a correct perception for, for that um, mental picture of emptiness that you have. It's not the direct perception of emptiness, but it's correct. It's OK. It's pretty good. OK? It's airtight, logically. OK? General emptiness. But then some schools say, when you are thinking about emptiness, uh, and you're perceiving emptiness in a way, can we say you're perceiving the emptiness of your thinking about emptiness? No. no. Why not? Because you have a... Just thinking is a positive... No, but how about as an intellectual thing? Can I say that when you think about emptiness, could you be thinking about the emptiness of that thought? Mm -hmm. Sure. That would be almost very natural, right? If the first emptiness you ever see directly is the emptiness of me, then it might be natural to say that the first emptiness you see on the path of preparation is the emptiness of your thinking about emptiness, the emptiness of your own mind, the emptiness of your own thoughts. Okay? And in that sense, we could say that that emptiness provides the foundation for Mahayana achievements, for Mahayana spiritual uh, realizations. And that's how emptiness is presented with regard to Rick. I'll say it again. <laughs> that emptiness, which provides the foundation for all the realizations you get on the five paths, can be called Rick in a way. Okay? That's the emptiness that you're thinking about. Really, the best, what he's trying to say is the best kind of emptiness that you can think about when you're thinking about emptiness is how about thinking about you thinking about emptiness and your emptiness and the emptiness of your own thoughts as you're thinking about emptiness. Why am I having this thought about emptiness? Yeah, or, or I have the virtue. I'm projecting this thought about, 
I'm pre- I got enough virtue, goddamn okay. massive virtue. I got that much virtue to be projecting myself thinking about emptiness. Okay? Like, if you get in a fight about emptiness with somebody, you're already into 99.999999% of anyone who ever lived lucky. You know? Because then you're thinking about it. To be projecting, for Michael to project Michael sitting around the table with coffee talking about emptiness to somebody is extraordinary virtue, extraordinary projection, you know? So let's talk about that emptiness, you know? That's empty too. You could have been talking about last week's movies. You could have been talking about TV shows. God, I did three weeks of this. You know, no, you get on, AOL comes up, new movie star, new TV star, new movie, new TV star, rock and roll star, you know, and over and over, and there's nothing else, you know, and it's like, how many new TV stars can you have? Oh, they're endless, you know, they just keep like this, you know, and, you know, to ha- what's the emptiness of thinking about emptiness, you see? It's so cool to have that projection. You know, if you want to think about emptiness, think about how cool it is to be thinking about emptiness. That's a, that's a good emptiness. Thinking about that emptiness would provide a basis for all Mahayana achievements. So, whenever Lord Buddha talked about emptiness with regard to come, Buddha nature, he talked about the emptiness that you're looking at as you go through those six incredible levels. Heat, peak, mastery, highest dharma, path of seeing, path of habituation. What's the emptiness of those? You know, what's the emptiness of your state of mind? Which if you're really uh, in it, in, if you're really up for it, if you're really in it, you should be looking at the emptiness of that thought itself. Okay? And that's Buddha nature. That's so cool. That's really what will, is a womb for Buddha. That's the heart of Buddha. You want some place to gestate your Buddha? Man, think about the emptiness of thinking about the emptiness. You know? And that's called Drupiten. Say Drupiten. Drupiten. Foundation of all Mahayana attainments. Take Chen Drupiten. And it's a big subject in our Sangha. It's one of the Sangha's favorite subjects, you know? What is the foundation for all higher realizations? Think about emptiness. What emptiness? Which emptiness? The emptiness of those realizations. I'll say it again. You know, where's a good place to, where's a good womb in which to gestate, conceive and gestate your Buddha? Buddha, you, to come. Right? Think about the emptiness of your thoughts of emptiness. Think about the emptiness of your thoughts of emptiness, which is to say, think about your own emptiness. That provides the foundation for all spiritual attainments. Okay? It's the emptiness of thinking about emptiness that is the real seed for Buddhahood. Okay. Because that, that thinking about emptiness can change into the direct perception of emptiness. Yeah. Which can... Later changes into the Buddhist body. You see? So that's the real womb. You know, that's so cool. You know? So that's whenever Rick comes up, it comes up in this context. What's the emptiness of those six realizations? What's the emptiness of those six stages? What's the emptiness of my own mind when I'm thinking about emptiness? What's the emptiness of me when I'm thinking about emptiness? And that's Rick. See, it's so cool. It just comes back on itself like that. If you want something that's going to trigger Buddhahood in you, that's it. Think about your own emptiness as you're thinking about emptiness. Okay? Uh, that's what this refers to. Okay? Um, there's no trail. There's no... You can't see it. What's Ming Mei Tsewe Te Chen Chen Mei Sing? Not objectifying compassion. Yeah, which is the first part of Jason Kappa's mantra. Yeah. Okay, uh, I bow to the person with love that sees nothing. Okay. Sees nothing. What do you mean sees nothing? It looks at sentient beings and sees their emptiness. Okay, so mimik is a code word ever since Buddha two and a half thousand years ago for what? Don't see anything. For emptiness, for the direct perception of emptiness. Okay, ever since two and a half thousand years ago, mimik me. Me, me, same thing. You don't see anything. Look up. Lots of birds travel between the spring and somewhere down there. I never know where they're going, but they go back this house like crazy all day long. It's very beautiful. You know, bright yellow, bright white, red. And um, they pass, and you don't see anything after they've gone. There's nothing there anymore, you know. And Buddha's saying, you know, your nature is like that. You can't see it. You just can't see it. It's like the 
trail of a bird. You know, it's emptiness. Okay, so from the very beginning, Lord Buddha spoke about Buddha nature in terms of can't see anything, and it's connected to each of the six paths. In the reading, you'll get the other 13, 12, okay, or five. I'm making it short tonight. The first six are the biggies. But then you'll get a beautiful um, comparison for the emptiness of your mind at second level of path of preparation, and then the emptiness of your mind at third level of path of preparation, and then the emptiness of your mind at the fourth level of path of preparation. The last of the 13 total is the emptiness of, the, of Rig, the emptiness of Buddha nature. Okay? So obviously we're on the right track. This is where the Buddha mentioned these things, from the Prajnaparamita Sutra. He's saying essentially that Buddha nature is invisible when he uses that question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is emptiness, is a negative, is an absence. There ain't no track there. Okay? Like that. Yeah? Kishla, could you just put together the, the translation of the Tibetan? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Let's go through it. Oh, Subhuti. Oh, Subhuti. Okay? Uh, when a, I'm just going to do a, a, a free translation. Oh, Subhuti. When a bird flies through the sky, it doesn't leave any track. You can't see any track. Okay? That's all. That's a reference to the emptiness of your mind at the first level of the path of preparation. Okay? Uh, what did I promise you next? What authority would satisfy anybody? Past Buddha is pretty good. How about a future Buddha? Okay? This is from my portrayal. This is from the Ornament of Realizations. Is one of the what? Five yeah, one of the five books that was given by whom to whom? Maitreya Sangha. Sangha during his trip to uh, Tushita. Tushita, which took how long? You get the reading tonight, by the way. 50 to 53 years human time, uh, a, morning. <laughs> a, a morning God, God time, God realm time, okay? <laughs> Uh, this is the first, Abhisama Ankara, for those of you who care, Munto Gen, okay? And he says, we had to memorize this when I was a kid. Okay, here we go. Topa Yini. Chudu. Jukpe Tenla. Rik. Sheja. Okay. Topa means what? Realization. It's a synonym for Lam. 
Lam and Tokpa are synonyms. When we say five paths, we're really talking about five stages of realization, right? But he says, Chidu, what's Tundu? Succession yoga. Chidu means the six, the six dharmas, okay? If you want to get into those things, those six realizations, here just Chidu just means things. Juke means get into it. If you want to get into those six realizations, which six? Sound familiar? From above. Yeah. Yeah, Chu Tsemu Supa Chucho, Tonglam, Gomlam. Okay? Four stages of the path of preparation, path of seeing, path of habituation. To start, again, there's seven more, which is the dot, dot, dot there. I left it out because I didn't want you to be here till midnight. 10 o'clock is okay. Okay? There's seven more. The last one happens to be Rick itself. But anyway, Jukpe, if you want to get into those six realizations, you need a foundation. Then, you need some place that everything is based on. Those realizations are based on something. You have to realize that in Tibetan, in Buddhist uh, perceptual theory, foundation is a word for what? Objects. Objects. Because the perception rests on the object, you see? Like, if there's a glass of lemonade with ice, and your visual perception rests on it, you see? It's there, and then you come along and you perceive it, right? So the, the, you can't have the perception without the glass of lemonade, okay? <laughs> Once you got the lemonade, the perception is triggered. So in a sense, the, the perception rests upon the lemonade, on the object. So ten often means like foundation, but also the object, okay? Of course, if you're in tantric, if you're in, what did we talk about last class, Sammo, Neumann? Which came first, the visual consciousness or the glass of lemonade? Is it like everybody thinks that the lemonade's there and then it triggers your perception of it? Or is it that you're projecting the lemonade after the consciousness? And in a sense, the, the awareness of the lemonade creates the lemonade. You see? That makes tantra possible. You see? That... You're not perceiving Vajrayogini, you're projecting her. That, that, makes Vajrayogini, that makes it possible for us to become Vajrayogini. But anyway, we're in Sutta right now, so I can't talk about that. <laughs> uh, okay. By the way, my idea, I was thinking about it, that the in-depth courses should be like halfway to Tantra, and then, you know, you just naturally bridge to the Tantric series from that. You know, but we'll talk about that. So like, I'm thinking that in the in-depth courses, which would be like, I don't know how many, but there's the 18 basic courses, sutra, open courses. But then by the time you get to the in-depth courses, I think you should be mixing in a little bit of tantra. And then you go all the way with the 18 tantra courses, you see? So I've been doing that. You might have noticed. Okay. Foundation la rik. To that, we she. We what? She. Call. That's what we call rik. Okay? You want to know what rik is? It's that object which is based on, you can get into those six perceptions, those six realizations. You want to know what Buddha nature is? You want to know what we call Buddha nature? We give that name to La, okay? That object or foundation, which provides the basis for those six realizations, which is what? The emptiness of those six realizations. The emptiness of your own mind, okay? You want to know what Buddha nature is? It's that emptiness, which is the foundation of those other six realizations. Is uh, Asanga coming up with this on his own, or is he pulling it out of somewhere? Ostensibly, he's getting it from Maitreya. Yeah, but Maitreya, as you'll notice, is, is drawing a lot on Gautama. Yes, Buddha. From the 20,000 verses especially. A lot of what Maitreya ever taught can be found in the 20,000 verses. I think he was trying to honor the previous Buddha. You see, it's almost like his guru, the last Buddha. He's like honoring the last Buddha. So for Maitreya, Gautama is the last Buddha, right? It's been a user. So anyway, you can see how this comes directly from the quotation before. Okay. Um, this is a take on the previous quotation, especially because there are 13 different realizations mentioned. I only gave you the first six. The dot, dot, dot is the mixing, missing seven, okay? Which are in your reading when you get it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. What is 
A juke means get into, enter. What's Bodhisattva Chari Avatar? Chinjuk, entering the ways of the Bodhisattva. Okay, uh, you okay? Got anything? Okay. Okay, I'm going to give you one more scriptural quotation to blow away your uh, friends with. And then, uh, of course, they use their own quotations, right? But we don't have to talk much about that. Um, <laughs> there's this last one. And then we'll take a break. We'll have some lemonade, if you can create it. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Say chicken ying. Say ying. Ying. It's like boom, you know, uh, that da bao yata ya giko yi, okay? Ying. It looks like ja, right? But it changes to ya under certain circumstances. So it's ying. Okay? Uh, chicken ying. Ki. Lo. Ni. Konala. Rikshe. Okay? What we call. Buddha nature, same thing as the last quotation, right? What we call Buddha nature refers, la, kona, only to the essence, the, the, the very essence, okay? I'll say it again. What we call Buddha nature refers only, kona, to the very essence, ngo nyi, okay? The very essence of the chuki ying. Chuki ying is dharma dhatu. That's Dhammadatta. It means the ether of all things, you know, the realm of all things. It's a word for emptiness. Okay? It's a word for emptiness. You know, the, the yin of all things. Okay? And it was meant to be onomatopoeic, you know, yin. Okay? Dhatu. Uh, so that's pretty blunt, okay? You want to know what Rick is? It's emptiness. Only. Nothing else. Okay, who said that? Hari Bhadra. Uh, I'll write it for you. Uh, 800s. We don't know exactly when, but... In Tibetan, Senge Sangbo. Senge is an interesting word. It's a corruption of a singer, Sanskrit word. What? Singha. Uh, which is the word where Singapore comes from. Pur means town or village. Uh, yeah, lion. The village of the lion, Singha, uh, Sengisambo. Okay? Anyway, Hari Bhadra. He's famous because he wrote the greatest explanation of Arya Sangha and Maitreya that ever existed. He wrote two commentaries called the Great Commentary and the Lesser Commentary. But and that ever, any Indian who ever wrote about, after a sangha, whoever wrote about a sangha in Maitreya, it was Haribhadra, okay? And the lineage is like that. You know, you get Lord Buddha teaching the perfection of wisdom. Then you get Maitreya teaching it, going over it with Arya Sangha. Okay, get it straight now. And then Haribhadra comments on that. Then Jetsu Kampa comments on them. And then you get our textbooks, Saramay textbooks, Sarajay textbooks, other great textbooks, okay? But that's the 
perfection of wisdom lineage. So what we're doing is we've gone up through all the Indian sources that would be accepted by all Tibetan schools. Okay, so that's pretty clear. You know, so that ends the sources. Okay, and next we'll go on to Rangluk, which is if you open up a ceremony textbook and you study the section called Buddha nature. What's the definition of Buddha nature? How many kinds of Buddha nature are there? What are the examples of Buddha nature? Okay, we'll go through that. And then to keep you awake, because it'll be late by then, we'll go through the tantric presentation of Buddha nature, which is kind of cool. I'm not going to give you the whole thing, but just sort of a, what do you call it? Cookie. 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 Teaser. Yeah, teaser is good. Okay, so we'll have a break. You want to do a little mandala? Yeah, Okay, have a nice break. <laughs>